Happy Easter LifePoint family. We are so excited to celebrate and worship with you this morning. You know, there are church buildings all over the country that are empty right now because we're not able to meet in a physical location in this season. However, the women who went to the site where Jesus was buried also found an empty tomb. You see, emptiness isn't always a bad thing. Because of that empty tomb on Easter morning, the church is alive and well. We have a risen Savior. Death has been defeated. So despite all that's going on in our world right now, those truths remain. And so we get to celebrate that this morning. Before we dive into worship through music, I wanted to remind you of all the resources that we have available to you on our website at lifepoint.org slash livestream. So be sure to check that out. Now let's turn it over to Pastor Trevor and his team as we all worship together. Welcome LifePoint family and happy Easter. We want to invite you no matter where you're at to stand, join us, worship, because he is risen. Sinners, come find His mercy. 
sound Once lost And now found Heaven Came down And grace rescued me How sweet The sound Once lost And now found Boundless grace 
<laughs> Easter is so important because Jesus died on the cross before that. It's because I know they get Easter eggs. It's what he died about for all sins. So there was. Um, there were vegetables and they were tacos and they said um, Easter isn't about just eggs it's about um, how Jesus died on the cross for us and how how churches work it's about how Jesus died on the cross and it was three days after um, it's the day he died rose yeah. from the dead Jesus is the one who um, lived on land most of the time. He helps us when we're sick and he helps us when we're always born. Mm, the Son of God. And he had these disciples and he helped out people like when they had problems. He's our Savior. Jesus is a person who like made the earth and everything. He's the Lord that um, protects us and, and tells us what to do. He is a man that help, helps us with every problem that he has and he gives us food, water, and, and he made the whole earth. He miracled, um, he miracled a glass of wine. Mm -hmm. Like turning into water. We don't know what Jesus looks like. He looks like God. He has long brown hair. And he has long brown beard. Are you sure? Yes. How do you know? Because because we saw him in the Bible. Uh, he had a beard and he yeah. wears lots of white. I think he saw mm -hmm. white <laughs> or all yellow. All yellow. Um, he has um, like his trip across him like that and it's brown. And he has a brown beard right <laughs> And God looks like Jesus. It's just he has a different hair. Um, three Jesus, days. Jesus got left on the cross and he died. On the cross? On the cross. Mm -hmm. On the cross. Um, um, on the cross. And to bring our sins to heaven. Um, he got buried up. His, so his body got um, took into a cave, and they put a big rock right there, and then they put no, they, some guards. Um, yeah, yeah. He bur they buried him and like the mama might mm -hmm. like they like they buried him, him. him, like they bury mommy mommies. Three days later, it was Easter, and he got out of the cross to because he got tomb because um he has powers to unlock himself. He rose from the dead. He he came alive. He rose from the dead. He rose from the dead. He uh, raised himself. Angels told them. Of the people that he, um, he was alive. And Three days after he died on the cross was that, like Leo, like Leo was saying, um, Mary, Jesus's mom, and Mary Magdalene were going to the tomb to like give spices or something to the tomb, and then, but when they went, the tomb was empty. But then down came an angel, and he said, "Don't be afraid of me." Jesus, Jesus is like back to life or something, and um, he rose again. He rose again, and then like, and then he 
then Jesus was like with some of his disciples then or something. And then Mary, Jesus's mom, was especially happy. And Mary Magdalene were like coming to Jesus and like praising him again. And like everything was like back to normal, except that those mean people. Bye, Life Point. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Well, wasn't that awesome? I mean, great job, kids. And we say to all of you, as the kids said, Happy Easter. You know, it's been incredible these last few weeks is we have had people joining us online from all over the country. In fact, many of you are LifePoint family members who've moved away and, and you've been joining us online. And so we just want to give a special shout out to you. Thank you for being a part of this and, and joining us again. Speaking of joining us, we'd love to have every one of you who are joining us today to take a moment and fill out our connection card. You can do that online, but you can also do it by taking out your phone and texting the word CONNECTING to 94000. CONNECTING to 94000. And you can follow that, fill all that out. We'd love to know that you are here with us today. You know, Easter really is the greatest day in history. Let me say that again. Easter is the greatest day in history. I love this day more than any other day. And if you're here with us today, watching online, wherever you're at, if you've been thinking about Jesus and exploring faith and and considering giving your life to Christ, today is that day. There's no better day to give your life to Jesus Christ than on Easter because this is the day that Jesus rose from the dead. Or as the kids said, He came alive, or as one of them said, he raised his (laughs) self. That was so great. He raised his self, thus validating everything that God ever said about the Savior and everything that Jesus said about himself being our Savior. You know, these are truly crazy times, and while church buildings are actually emptied and services at churches have been canceled, I want you to think about something for a moment. The church gathering around the world today is far from being canceled. In fact, I suspect that there are more people today listening, watching uh, uh, from their homes or wherever they are, and participating in Easter services today more than there ever has been in the history of mankind. And not only that, but I suspect that more people are going to give their life today to Jesus Christ for the very first time than has ever happened in history before. So the buildings may be empty, but the message of Easter is getting into your home and the homes of, of millions upon millions more than ever before. So the kingdom of God is growing. The kingdom of God is moving forward. And I don't know about you, but when I think about that, I mean, that is just an incredible thought. That's a great reason to celebrate and to praise God this particular Easter. Well, I, I want to dive in a little bit today, and I believe that what we're talking about today is so, so important for our lives today. And I want to give you the reason that Easter is important. It's a message that you need today, that I need today, that we all need today and for the coming months to come. So in order to grasp the the magnitude of the Easter message, what I want to do is I want to back up and I want to give you some context and I want to explain an important part of the backstory of Easter. You know, I love backstories. I love knowing, uh, based on where we're at today, how did we get here? What happened, what occurred before that led to this moment? I love backstories. And so I love that we are celebrating the resurrection of Jesus today, that Jesus is alive. But I want to look at something that set that all up, that happened a few days prior when Jesus hung on the cross, when he breathed his last breath, and then he died. So I want to tell you about that part of the story And that part of the story is what makes the message of Easter all the more powerful. So let's start with the Jewish temple in Jerusalem. 
There's much about that Jewish temple that sent a message. It wasn't necessarily a message it intended to send, but it, but it was a message nonetheless. And the message was essentially, stay away. Oh, let me explain that. Uh, the temple itself was, was separated into two main rooms. There was the holy place, and then there was the most holy place, or what we often call the holy of holies. Now, only p- priest could enter in to the holy place. And, and they would enter in at certain times and in certain ways, and, and they did prescribe religious you know, uh, 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 ceremonies that they, that they had to do. Nobody ever just hung out in the holy place. You came to do God's business, and then you left. But even more sacred than the holy place was the inner chamber, or the most holy place, what we call the holy of holy. Holy of Holies. This was the very center of Jewish worship that took place in that small area. In fact, if you want to read more about it, you can see some of the details. It's spelled out in Leviticus chapter 16. You can check that out sometime. Now, there is one person, only one person who could ever enter the most holy of place or the Holy of Holies, and that was the high priest. And this high priest could only enter the most holy place one day out of the year. And it was a specific day. It was the Day of Atonement or Yom Kippur. When he entered, he was required to wear special garments and he would bring in with him the blood of of a bull and a goat and he would sprinkle that blood specifically on the golden mercy seat, which was the top of the Ark of the Covenant. God's response then to that action, to that offering was God's promise to forgive the nation of Israel for, of all their sins for the previous year. Now, if anyone besides the high priest entered into the most holy place, he would be struck down. If the high priest entered on any other day but the Day of Atonement, he would be struck down. If the high priest came in without the blood of the, of the bull or the goat, he would be struck down. It was as if the temple was this, you know, this giant roadblock making sure that nobody came into God's presence uninvited. Everything about the whole system screamed out, stay away, do not come near. You are not qualified to come in here, especially on your own. Don't miss it. No uh, Jewish person would ever dream of entering into the most holy place, the, the holy of holies. It was off limits. Let me say it again. No Jew would ever dream of entering into the most holy place. It was off limits. The, that was the place where God dwelt. And so that location, that spot, that place was off limits. Now, if you want to have a greater understanding of Easter... If you want to have a greater understanding of the significance of Easter, then then you would do well, and I would do well, to understand the temple, and more specifically, to understand this most holy place and to understand the veil. Well, what is the veil? The veil was was the cloth, a single piece of cloth, that separated the most holy place from the holy place. Jewish tradition from the rabbi's writings tell us that the veil was the thickness of, 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 from a man's thumb to his middle finger. That's how thick the veil was. So about six to eight inches thick was that veil. Also, we know that the, that the veil was about 60 feet tall. It was about 20 feet wide. And those same Jewish writings tell us that it took about 300 priests to lift that up and to get that into place. This veil or this curtain was sending a message that you and I don't belong in the Holy of Holies. You can't come in here. You don't have direct access to God. But everything was about to change. So I want to check this out. I want to turn to Matthew chapter 27. You can go with me in your Bibles or to the YouVersion Bible app. Matthew chapter 27. Matthew is one of Jesus' disciples. And he's going to write this. We're going to look at verse 33 together. Matthew chapter 27, verse 33. And it says this. It says, And when they came to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, verse 35, 
They crucified Jesus. And then in verse 50, it says this, And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit, or he died. Now I want you to watch this. Look at verse 51. At that what? And I want everybody to say this word, no matter where you're at. If you're in your living room, if you're with family, if you're by yourself out on a walk, no matter where you are, let's say this word together. At that what? At that? I didn't hear you. At that what? At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. What was God's very first official act the moment that Jesus died? What did God do? God tore that curtain or that veil from top to bottom, thereby opening up the Holy of Holies or the most holy place. So why would God do it? Why would God rip the veil in half immediately following at that moment that Jesus died? Why was that so important? Why was that message so important? And what was the message that God was sending us? And how does that torn veil relate to what happens three days later, to the message of Easter? Well, let's revisit how Jesus' followers uh, uh, recounted this well-known Easter story. In fact, in the video that we saw with the kids, I love that Caitlin, man, she just did an awesome job in that, didn't she? And Caitlin, at the end of that video, she actually shared this passage that I'm going to read with you right now. She just did that from memory. That was awesome. Way to go, Caitlin. And so let's read that passage that she shared with us. Matthew chapter 28. We're going to start in verse 1. Here's the well-known Easter story. Matthew chapter 28, verse 1, it says this. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and they became like dead men. I, I probably would too. The angel said to the women, woman, uh, women, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. And here's the words that we all know. He is not here. What does it say? He has what? He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he laid. Verse 7, then go quickly. And tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead, and he's going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. Verse 8. So the woman, the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, of course, yet filled with joy. And they ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly, Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him and they clasped his feet and they worshiped him. They didn't want to let go, man. Jesus is here with them and they're holding on. Verse 10, then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. Now I want to jump ahead to another part of the story in Luke chapter 24. And it starts in verse 36. And Luke tells us this. The disciples were gathered and he says, while they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Now let's look at verse 39. Jesus said this. He said, Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and blood, as you see I have. You see, there's the Easter story in a nutshell. It started with Jesus dying on the cross, the veil ripping. He was then buried, and then he rose from the dead. And here's a key part of the Easter story. People who saw him dead then saw him alive. Romans chapter 1 tells us he was shown to be the Son of God, when he was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 17 said, God has given proof of this to all of us by raising Jesus from death. Jesus is alive. 
He rose from the dead. He was seen by people alive. Therefore, everything that matters before He died, everything that matters before He passed away, before He was crucified, everything that He said, everything that He claimed, every little detail, the backstory, it matters. Which means the torn veil matters. There is power in the message of the torn veil that symbolized and represented the very heart and soul of everything Jesus died on the cross to accomplish. And it's the writer of Hebrews who actually best explains the power of the Easter message and and the veil. And so I want to check this out together. We're going to look at Hebrews chapter 9. So let's turn there now, or again, you can go in your Bibles or the U version, however you're tracking along with us. Hebrews 9. Let's listen to how the story is described. It says this starting in verse 3, Hebrews 9. It says, There was a curtain, and behind the curtain was the second room called the most holy place. See, we already talked about this, so that's not unfamiliar to you. This is the holy of holies. Verse 7, but only the high priest ever entered the most holy place. And we told you about that. And by the way, how often could he do it? Notice what it says, only once a year. And he always offered blood for his own sins and for the sins the people had committed. That's what he went in with, the blood of the, of, the, of the bull and the goat. He took it in to offer for their sins, right? Just like we talked about. Look at verse 8. All of this was the Holy Spirit's way of saying who? I want you to say these two words out loud. All of this was the Holy Spirit's way of saying who? What's the two words? Who? No one could enter the most holy place. In other words, we did not have access to God. God was not really available. God was not really approachable. There was a barrier between us and God. But Jesus did something to resolve that barrier. Speaking now of Jesus, the writer then says this in verse 12. He says, with his own blood, with Jesus' own blood, not the blood of the goats or the calves, he, Jesus, entered the most holy place, catch this, once for all time, and secured our redemption forever. Are you tracking with me? Are you, are you hanging with me here? Because look at verse 14, by his, what sacrifice? By his one sacrifice, he only had to do it once, his one sacrifice or his one offering, some translations say, he has forever set free from sin the people he brings to God. Man, what an incredible message. God is sending to us this Easter. That God, what's the first message? That God ripped the veil. He ripped that curtain wide open. And rather than the high priest entering in with the blood of an animal to make an offering so that the people's sin could be forgiven for the previous year, instead, what happened? This passage tells us Jesus went in. And Jesus' death on the cross was that final one-time for all-time sacrifice. And rather than using the blood of animals, it was the blood of Christ that was offered as the final sacrifice for our sins. And so the message this imposing temple had been sending us that God is not uh, available to us, that God is not approachable to us, that is no longer the message. There's a new message. The message of Easter, Jesus is the final offering of God. And that God, to God, and that God is now accessible, and that God is now available, the barrier between God and us, the bar- bar- barrier between God and you and me, is no longer there. It has been removed. We have access to God. There's another part of this incredible message that God sent by ripping that veil. This is kind of the the big so what, right? And listen to the so what. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 9. And it says this, And so, there's the so what. And so, what's the so what? So what does this matter? What does this mean? And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter. Another translation says we can enter with confidence. Heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the what? Through the curtain or through the veil into the most holy place. Into the most holy place. Into where God is. 
Man, I don't know if you're tracking with me. I don't know if you're following along and catching this incredible message, but God split that curtain in two the moment that Jesus died because that was the final sacrifice for our sins so that you and I could now have an opportunity to have access to God and to be in his presence. Therefore, therefore, in light of all of this, therefore, here's why this matters. Here's the so what does this mean? Therefore, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22. Therefore, let us, let you, let me, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting Him. Let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts and fully trusting Him. There it is, gang. There it is. God is inviting every single person to draw near to Him, to come into His presence. The ripping of that veil, that veil ripped, affirmed in the resurrection of Jesus, that is our full access pass into the presence of our Heavenly Father. We are allowed in. The walls have come down. The curtain, the veil has come down. And now, God's available. And now, God is approachable. And so each one of us, we can personally come before God because of what Jesus did on the cross and then validated by rising from the dead. Please, please don't miss the totality of the Easter story. Don't miss that the resurrection of Jesus, He is alive. The resurrection of Jesus put an exclamation point on the the ripping of that veil. Think about it. When it happened, nobody knew what the ripping of the veil meant. That day that Jesus died, they didn't understand it. But three days later... Jesus rose from the dead. Jesus came back alive. Uh, he, as w- w- remember one of the girls said, he raised himself. And when Jesus came back alive, all of a sudden, oh, that's what the torn veil is all about. That's what it was meant to be. Oh God, you are so brilliant. Years later, the Apostle Paul shared the point of the Easter story with the believers in Rome, with the Christians in Rome. And he described it this way in Romans chapter 5, verse 1. He said this. He said, since we have been justified, and that's just a fancy word that means declared not guilty, or it means we've been made right with God. Since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And here it is. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, verse 2, through whom we have gained access. Man, it's an incredible picture. It's an incredible verse. It's an incredible thought. Through Jesus Christ, we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. Paul, the Apostle Paul in his very own words is saying that the torn veil, which was authenticated, and what it meant was authenticated with the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. That means that you and I, we have access to God. We have access to God. Now, this is important. Who has access to God? Well, let me explain that for a moment. Uh, you know, we, we understand that God created all people. We are made in God's image. So everybody is created by God, but you know something? Not all people are children of God. We are created by God, but not all are children of God. You're sitting there thinking, what do you say? Wait, wait, I thought we're all child, children of God. Well, let me explain to you. Those who are children of God are the ones who have trusted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Let me explain this to you. John chapter 1, verse 12 says it this way. It says, to all who believed Him and accepted Him, referring to Jesus, to all who believed and accepted Jesus, He gave the right to become what? To become children of God. Listen, it's only when you and I trust Jesus. It's only when we trust in Jesus. It's only when we trust what Jesus did on the cross for us. When we trust Jesus for our salvation. That's that, that is when we enter into the family of Almighty God. And one of the privileges that you and I get when we enter into the family of God as validated in the resurrection because of the torn veil, one of the privileges is that we have immediate access to God. 
Hey man, I, I basically have this policy with my kids when they call me on the phone. And, and the policy basically goes like this. I'll answer the phone. If, if I see the phone, uh, I hear the phone, if I see it, uh, their picture show up, or if I feel it in my pocket vibrate, no, it doesn't matter what I'm doing. It doesn't matter what meeting I'm in, who I'm talking to. It doesn't matter the situation. Even when I'm preparing for a sermon, which that's really sacred time for me, and I don't, do, I don't answer or take anything during that time, even if my kids call during that time, at any time, if I see them call, I pick up the phone. And I find out, hey, how's it going? What's going on? Anytime. They know that when they call me, if I notice or see it or, or, or know they're calling, I will pick up the phone. They have instant access to me anytime. They're my kids. Listen, that's how it is with God. If you call out to God, God's like, uh, hey, excuse me, Gabriel, you know, excuse me, Michael, I I know we're planning like end of the world stuff right now, but hey, my kid's calling me right now. I got to take this. He's like, okay, I'll get back to you in a moment. Hey, son. Hey, daughter. How's it going? I'm so glad you called. What's going on? What could I do for you? Because of the death and resurrection of Jesus, God is available and approachable any time that you or I reach out. We have instant access to the throne of God. That means you and I can call anytime, anywhere we are, as often as we like, for any reason at all. Our Heavenly Father will not turn me away. He will answer my call. Ephesians 2.18, through Jesus We have access to the Father. See, that's why God ripped that veil in two. That's why he did that the moment that Jesus died, to make sure we understand this clearly, that there's no confusion. And so I want to ask you an important question this morning, this Easter. If you are a Jesus follower, which means you are a child of God, how often do you fully utilize your free access to your Heavenly Father? How often do you take advantage of the fact that you can call Jesus anytime, any moment, and he picks up the phone and he answers it? Because the message of the resurrection, the message of Easter, is that God is available to you. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16 says, So whenever we are in need, we should come bravely before the throne of our merciful God. There we will be treated with undeserved grace, and we will find help. And I got to tell you, as a believer, sometimes I forget that I have that access to God. And that's why I wanted to be reminded of that this Easter, especially in this season. What Jesus did on the cross and what was validated in his resurrection was that I have access to my heavenly father. You have access to your heavenly father. See, there's times I forget That when I'm in need, he's there to help me. Sometimes I forget that he's there. And instead of having that instant access, you know, pursuing that instant access, instead of accessing the peace of God, what do I sometimes do? I fret, I worry. What about you? Instead of accessing his strength, I find that I'll exhaust myself trying to work it out in my own energy. And instead of accessing his wisdom, I try to do it my way and then I just end up doing dumb things and unwise things. Instead of accessing hope in Christ, I end up despairing. Instead of accessing his comfort, I end up lonely and hurting. Instead of accessing his power, I end up afraid. God says, don't forget Please don't forget, I have a better way than you doing it yourself. You have access to me. There is no curtain any longer. There is no veil any longer. And I have validated the message of that ripped curtain, that ripped veil by raising my son Jesus from the dead. Go check it out. The tomb is empty. So wherever you are, whenever you are in need, come bravely, God says. Come confidently, God says, into my very presence and give me your hurts. Give me your pains and your burdens and your problems and your worries and your concerns. Give it all to me because you have access to me. I'm your heavenly dad and I want to talk with you. Call me up. I will pick up the phone. No matter what I'm doing, I am available to you. 
You follow a resurrected Savior. I follow a resurrected Savior. So go on in. Tell them your struggles. Tell them the struggles you're having with your children. You follow a resurrected Savior, so go on in and tell him that your job is about ready to let people go and you're worried about that. Go on in and tell him, hey, you just got laid off and you're worried about that. You follow a resurrected Savior, go on in and tell him your health problems. He's there to help. You follow a resurrected Savior, go on in and tell him you need to pay the bills, the mortgage, you need to take care of this. God says, Hebrews 4, 16, give it to me bring it to me you can come boldly before me you can bring it to me and I will give you my peace you will find help I am your heavenly father I am your heavenly dad I'll take your call listen just keeping it real here if Jesus had stayed dead died on that cross buried in the tomb and stayed buried in the tomb then none of what we have talked about today matters. We'd still be wondering, what's the point of that torn veil? But because Jesus rose from the dead, he defeated death. So everything that he said and everything that he did prior, it matters. Everything God said about Jesus matters. The ripping of the curtain and what it signifies. It matters. And so the message of the torn curtain, the message of the torn veil, the message of the empty tomb, the message of the resurrected Savior, the message of Easter is that God is madly in love with you. God loves you, and he wants you to have full access to him. He's available to you. He's approachable. He wants you to come in anytime and give him anything. Talk to him about anything. And you can know with confidence, the Bible says, that the truth of this message has been validated when Jesus rose from the dead. He is alive today. And that's why we can say he is risen. And so we can say happy Easter. And we can say we know we serve and we follow a living God. Here's the bottom line. Very few people, as I think about the season we're in, very few people are going to get COVID-19 and even fewer people are going to die from it, relatively speaking to the population of the world. It's not to dismiss it or diminish it, but relatively speaking, and not to be morbid here, but this is true. A hundred years from now, we will have all passed from this life. So I'm asking you this morning to look at this bigger picture to get ready for eternity now, today, this Easter. How do you get ready for Easter or for eternity? Simple. You invite Jesus into your life. He died so that you could live. You invite Jesus into your life and He'll come into your life and He'll live in your heart. He'll forgive you of your sins. He'll give you His peace for whatever storm you're going through. And there's a lot of storms going on around us. He will give you, you know, his cell phone number, so to speak, so that you can call him anytime and have direct access to him anytime. And he'll give you the absolute assurance that you will go to heaven when you die. So, do you want access to your heavenly father? Do you want the confidence to know that you will be with him in all eternity when you pass from this life? If you want that, Jesus is calling you. Are you ready? Are you ready to say yes to him? Are you ready this Easter to say, I'm going to give my life to Jesus? He gave his life for me. I want to give my life to him. Well, if that's you, I'm going to invite you to pray with me right now. It's not these exact words, but it's more that you would mean it in your heart. So let's bow our heads. I'm going to ask you, no matter where you are, no matter where you're watching this, from your home, your living room, your dining room, kitchen, wherever you are, if you're out even on a walk, maybe pause for a moment. And let's just bow our heads. If you're walking, maybe just pause for a moment and stop. And let's pray. Lord Jesus, we come before you now and we praise you. We worship you. God, I think about what you did 2,000 years ago, that you allowed yourself to be made in our image and, and come as a human being. 
to, to be like one of us, I should say. And you allowed that to happen. You allowed us to then kill you. You allowed that, God, because you knew your power over death would reign supreme. And you knew, God, that in that moment on that third day, you would raise Jesus from the dead. And so, God, we thank you for that. We thank you, God, that you ripped that veil reminding us that you want to have access to us. You want us to have access to you. You reminded us, God, that you love us. And so, God, we come before you now to give our hearts to you, our lives to you, our souls to you. And if that's you, if you want to give your life to Jesus Christ, would you pray with me right now? It's not these exact words. Just mean it in your heart. Say something like this. Say, Heavenly Father, I believe. I believe that Jesus died for me. I believe that he was buried. I believe that he rose from the dead and that he was seen by people alive. So Jesus, right now I come before you and I place all my hope, all my faith, and all my trust in you. I'm no longer going to trust myself with my life. I'm going to trust you with my life. So I transfer my trust to you. I surrender my life to you. I give my life to you. Thank you for saving me and giving me a brand new life. Thank you for giving me direct access to my heavenly Father. And it's in Jesus' name I pray these things. Amen. Lord Jesus, we rejoice with those who have joined your family today at LifePoint and across the world as people are praying that prayer. Thank you, Jesus. We believe, we trust, we know you are alive. You have risen from the dead. Our hope, our faith is in you. Thank you for the access we have to you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.
As we wrap up our time together this morning, I want to encourage you, if you haven't done so already, to take a minute and fill out a connection card. It's a great way for you to let us know what's going on in your life or to let us know of a next step you're looking to take in your relationship with God. You can also submit a prayer request. The staff, elders, and prayer team consider it a privilege to be able to pray for you, and so we'd love to hear from you about whatever's going on in your life. If you're part of the LifePoint family, we want to give you an opportunity to give an offering as part of your worship. Uh, you'll see the ways that you can go about doing that on the screen. And we would just want to say thank you for your continued generosity throughout this season. If you're newer to LifePoint, maybe you've been coming for a couple of months or you've joined us for a couple of online services. Uh, your next step is attending Next Steps online. It's a class that we would consider to be your starting point. That class is going to happen on Sunday, April 19th at 1230, and you can register or sign up for that on our website. And then finally, we want to do our best to stay connected in this season. And so one of the ways that you can go about doing that is by joining one of our online groups or life groups. You can browse all of those on our website. You can also get registered just right there on the website as well. Thank you so much for joining us. Happy Easter and have a great week.